Hi, in this video I'm going to show you how to get some descriptive statistics in Excel. And it could be as easy as just going to the data tab using the analysis group under data analysis. This data analysis window will open up and what we want to do is get some descriptive statistics. Now if you don't have this option available to you, you can just get it from Microsoft. You just Google Microsoft Excel install data analysis tool pack. And It'll, there will be probably be instructions on how to do it. But since we have it here, what we're going to do is just go through the ease of getting these descriptive the statistics. I select that, click OK, and I'm going to select my input range. I have this icon here. I'll explain that a little bit later. But my input range is cell A1 to A28. This could be effectively four weeks of cookie sales. Now my data is grouped by columns. There's one column here. There is a label in the first row, which is that cookie sales. My output rate out options, I probably want it on this one worksheet here. So I'm going to put it here. I don't want it on a new worksheet. I want it to show you right here. So I'll just select uh, D5. Select in the cell, go to D5. And I want my summary statistics. So these are the descriptive summary statistics. I'm not going to worry about confidence level. We won't cover that in this video, or the uh, k largest and smallest values. We don't need to select that. Click OK, and we have our descriptive statistics. Select the column, double click here to auto fit, and we have a series of our statistics. You probably are familiar with some of them, like mean, median, and mode, and I'll cover the different Excel functions that we can also use to get to this data. So you might, might think, oh, that was pretty easy. All I need to do is just install data analysis, the analysis tool pack, and just select my range, and I've got my descriptive statistics here. Well, if you didn't want to do that, you can also get your descriptive statistics another way, and there are different functions to do that. Now, I'm going to cover the different statistics here. Uh, there's kind of two broad categories I'm going to cover. One are the functions that give you kind of the the central tendency and one are the functions that give you kind of the dis dispersion of data. So some of the statistics that give you central tendency are the mean, median, and mode. So for example if I type average, double click that, and select my averages here, my, my data here, close parentheses, press enter, you'll see that I have my average. I'm gonna also type formula text so I can sh it shows you the formula that's typed there select that cell press enter so that's the average formula so av the mean is a measure of central tendency other me other measures of central tendency are the median mode so the median is just the middle value so that's equals median press tab to complete that and it's a2 to a28 so I'm just going to type a2 colon a28 press enter and we've got our median which matches that. I'm going to bring this formula down, drag the fill handle, click on the cell, drag the little fill handle here all the way down so I don't have to type in that formula, that formula text formula over and over again. All right, so that's the median. So the mode is what are is my most commonly repeating value. All right? So I'll type mode and we have our mode mode and mode single. Since I kind of know this data, I know that there's probably only one set of data that is appearing um, the most. And that's the number six, right? So I'll type A2 colon A28, close parentheses, press enter, and we have our six here. Now the reason why you have the difference between mode mode and mode sing is if you kind of know that there's uh, more than one number that occurs the most. So there, there might be a tie. Maybe the number six and the number four both occur six times. And so you would use that mode. Um, right now we use mode. Let's let's show you what the other ones look like. So we have our mode sync and mode single. So the mode single is the one that gives you that six. Mode mode gives you the option of looking at multiple numbers that occur the most. Uh, let me give you an example. So we have 2, 2, and let's say we have 4, 4, and this is 6. Let's make this a 4, and then make this a 6. All right, and so we do mode equals mode, we'll choose single, and 
my numbers here, it's going to bring back four. Press enter, right? Now let's say that the number four and the number two show up three times. So let's put two here. And we're going to change this. Let's change this formula to include row eight. Right. It's only it's still it's gonna select the first number that shows up twice. It should also show this number, right? And it doesn't do that because it's the mode single. If I use mode multi, I would have to kind of select the kind of multiple ranges of cells and type equals mode multi and select my numbers here. And since it's going to give me back uh, the number I need to type in the special keyboard combination shift control enter you can see it's giving me my most used or repeated numbers two and four so that's the difference between mode sing and mo single mode multi I'll delete this right now control minus sign deletes that right so these are our more common central tendency statistics the mean the median and the mode uh, other kind of type of statistics that are here that are related to this are the kurtosis. Now this kurtosis statistic is basically telling us the distribution of the tails. If I type in equals KURT, press tab to open the parentheses, A2 to A28, close parentheses, it's going to give me the same number I have here. So that's my kurtosis statistic. The skewed, the skewness statistic tells me if it is a left tail or a right tail type of distribution. And I'm going to show this a little bit later on, but let me type in the command that will tell you how to get the skew. So that's skew, tab to open parentheses, my number is A2 to A28, close parentheses, and we have the same numbers we have there. So a little bit more on these two particular statistics. And we're going to go to our central tendency tab here. I had this as lemon sales. These are actually supposed to be cookie sales, but uh, I'll leave that. Just think, when you see lemon, it, those are the cookie sales. This particular graph is actually showing this data. This is a normal distribution, uh, normal distribution uh, chart. It follows a normal, a normal bell curve. You can see that. As I mentioned earlier, the statistics, the skewness, tells you if it's skewed to the right, which is positively skewed, or is skewed to the left, which is negatively skewed. So this positively skewed one, you can see most of the values are on the left here, but we have a tail here. So there's, there's, some, there's some tail data. So this is positively skewed. So this particular chart is represented by uh, this particular value here, where we, have, where we have the low numbers are. You can see the columns raise up for the low numbers. and we only have a few that will represent the tail. So the skewness uh, grows a little bit more and it's positive, right? So if we look at our normal data, you can see the skewness is very, very small. That's like close to, to, to zero, you know, even though it's negative, it's very tiny. Now we have our left skewed, which is our negatively skewed data, right? And so that shows us that the tails are onto the left, so it's negatively skewed. So this particular graph is shown by this set of data, right? We have a bunch of eights and tens, and we have got a small tail here, and the skewiness you can see is negative. It's it's trending toward uh, the negative, less than zero. So that's what this, what the skewiness tells us. Is it predominantly left skew, positively skewed or negatively skewed? So we can see, also see here that when we're looking at the mean, median, mode, and or in a normal distribution, they're all the same, but depending on the data we can have it where they're different. In this example where we have the right skew data, you can see the median, it's kind of bimodal, right? There's two modes, as I mean, right? So there's a, the median is over to the left of the mean. And our, here on our negative, negatively skewed data, we also don't have it where all the median mode and mean are all the same. We have the mean a little bit farther to the right and our median and mode are to the left. So even though they're measures of central tendency, you can see that they're not always the same. It depends on your data. Let's get back to our first tab here and look at our other statistics. So we have these other statistics here. We have our sum and our count, and that's pretty self-explanatory, right? So if I selected all my data here, my sum 162, it's right here, and my count, the count of how many values are there, right? There's 27 values there, 
right? So this is going to be used in both our central tendency statistics and also our dispersion statistics, which I will cover now. So for the dispersion statistics, well, let's let's uh, let's first use some functions to kind of replicate this. So this, of course, is going to be a sum. So that's going to be sum of a two colon to a twenty eight. So that's going to also give us that sum. And this count, we can use a counting function, do count, and this will count the number of cells that contain numbers, which are here, open parentheses, a2 colon a28. And that will give us that summary statistic. Uh, I might as well do minimum and maximum because they're going to uh, affect our dispersion statistic range. So our maximum is pretty easy. You use the max function, open tab to open parentheses, a2 colon a28 gives us our maximum data, which our maximum value, which is 10, and a minimum. There is a complementary minimum function, min colon, I'm mean, open parentheses, a2 colon a28. Close parentheses, press enter. Right? So that gives us two, which matches that. The range basically is your highest value minus your lowest value. So that's going to equal our max minus our min. Right? Another way to do this, say, okay, we'll do max a2 to a28 minus min a2 to a28. Close parentheses, press enter. That's going to give us 8, which is reflective of that. Now let's get into our uh, dispersion statistics. We have standard error, standard deviation, and standard sample variance. Now these particular statistics, uh, well maybe with the exception of standard error, are looking at sample data. So when we have a population, we can keep an eye on this icon now, if we have a population, let's say that we've got a bunch of Girl Scouts selling their cookies and they're in the city. And what we want to know is what are the mean, median, and what are the standard deviations, what's the variance of uh, the data. Now it may be really challenging to go out and ask every one of these families to get information back on their sales. So what we do is we take a sample. Like maybe we know one particular Girl Scout that's selling that sold the cookies within the four week period or another one. And we're going to use that sample as a representation of our population. And that's what statistics is kind of all about. You're kind of taking a sample of something to try to get an idea and infer based on your sample of the population. Now, with the sample, you're, you can get a bunch of different uh, samplings, right? You get, you, they're, they're all can be a normal distribution, bell curve, but the mean, median, the mean, medians, and modes may be all a little bit different. But if we get enough samples, we can infer that those particular statistics are pretty much representative of the population. And that's kind of what standard error is kind of telling us, because that is telling us that it's the standard deviation of our sampling distribution, or our multiple samples, right? It's going to err plus, you know, plus or minus a certain amount. And now if we get back to our data here, that's what our standard error is telling us. Uh, because based on our sample, we can kind of infer from the whole population that it's not going to vary, it's going to vary this much from the mean. To find out the standard error, what we need to do is find the standard deviation first. So I'm going to cover this one first. And there is a function for this, right? So I'm going to type equal standard deviation, so standard dev. And you'll notice that there are a bunch of standard deviation functions. What we want to do is, since this is a sample, this is not the population, this is a sample, we're going to type standard deviation.s based on the sample. You can see if I clicked on the P, it's going to give you the population one. We don't want that. We want the standard deviation of the sample. Double click that, and it's going to be A2 to A28. Close parentheses, press enter, and you'll see that the values are exactly the same. So if I did population, you'll notice that the values are different, right? So the standard deviation of the sample, let me change that back to S, takes into account of the idea that this is a sample. It's not the entire population. So what it's doing, the, not, not to get too much deep into it, what it's doing is it's taking the number of values minus one as a denominator. Um, so that is what it's doing. 
This variance is also a, another function that we have available to us to figure it out. So we can do standard, uh, let's see, we can do variance. And this is also variance of population and variance of the sample. So it's var.s. Click on that, a2 to a28. Close parentheses, press enter. And we have our variance there. So it matches that. Now to get the standard error, what you need to do is take the standard deviation and divide it by the square root of the count. So that's going to be square root of the count. Press enter and we have our values there. So what are the standard deviation, standard variance, and I kind of explained standard error earlier because it's basically a standard deviation of the sampling distribution. What is the standard deviation variance? Well, we're going to look at dispersion. And what we do is if we had a normal distribution curve, which we have in our data, but we're focusing on the mean. And a standard deviation, let's make this a little bit smaller. A standard deviation of 235, which we got here, right, 235, what we're saying is with the first standard deviation, most of the data is going to fall in between 6 uh, plus 235, which is about a little bit 8, 235, and 6 minus 235, which is a little bit under 4, right? So, so this is saying the first standard deviation, deviation of data, it's going to fall within that range. You can see it does fall in that range based on our normal distribution curve. Now the variance is a little bit bigger because it basically is a square. You can see the form of the variance here. It's a square of the differences of the values from the mean divided by the number of values. And that's represented in square numbers. And it's just another way to say that, you know, this is how the, va the data is distributed. But since it's squared, there's not, it doesn't really uh, align too much with the original data. And that's why we have standard deviation because the standard deviation is expressed in the same units as the mean, whereas the variance is expressed in square units. So, so standard deviation is a more used statistic metric for dispersion because it's not a squared units like the variance is. So that's a little bit more than I wanted to talk about when we're describing using uh, or getting descriptive statistics out of Excel. Now this is the easy way to do it, going into data and data analysis, but here's the other ways that we can get the same data by using the different functions that we have available in Excel. So that's kind of an overview of the descriptive statistics functions in Excel. So I hope that helps. Thanks for watching. Thank you.